C-SPAN 2. After a lunch break, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. continued proceedings in the Microsoft antitrust case. Attorneys representing Microsoft and the federal government answered questions from the seven-judge panel during this hour and 45-minute portion of the hearing. We may proceed. Nobody clear? Thank you, Your Honor. I'm afraid all you on what we have today. I'll speak from this side. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, the subject of, uh, of this afternoon's uh, argument is uh, the tying claim. Uh, the allegation that Microsoft created a technological tie between Internet Explorer and Windows is central to the government's case under both Sections 1 and 2 of the Sherman Act. Uh, in sustaining that claim, uh, under Section 1, the District Court ignored established precedent, including this Court's June 1998 decision in an earlier case involving Microsoft. Uh, as in any tying case, the threshold issue here is whether Windows and Internet Explorer are separate products. Uh, in articulating uh, the test for addressing this issue uh, in the consent decree case, this Court it referred to cases under both Sections 1 and 2, as well as the Aretha Treatise, uh, synthesizing the learning on the subject. And even the District Court agreed that that uh, articulation was meant to be a framework for resolving the issue. The District Court nevertheless rejected this Court's test and instead applied the so-called consumer demand test of Jefferson Parish and Kodak the very test that the government pressed on this court in 1998 and which the court declined to accept. Uh, uh, for uh, both Jefferson and P Parrish and Kodak, however, dealt with contractual ties, not challenges to product design. For example, Kodak involved an alleged tie of replacement parts for Kodak photocopiers and repair service. As this court observed, the Supreme Court would not have subjected an integrated product such as a self-repairing copier to this same analysis. <coughs> In other words, the ability to identify separate demand for parts and repair service would not suggest that such an integrated product was really a tie-in. This court also recognized, and I think this point is uh, uh, quite important, that the application of the consumer demand test to product design decisions would chill innovation because it would retard integration, which in many fields has been the engine for achieving technological progress. The Let me ask you, our previous decision um, has been subjected to, to, to some criticism by the government in terms of uh, the threshold is, is, too, is too low. Um, and that at least uh, the concurring dissenting opinion suggested there was a way uh, to be more consistent with Jefferson Parish's emphasis on consumer demand than the majority opinion had been. My question is whether or not you think under that alternative approach concerns that you have about innovation are satisfactorily addressed? Uh, uh, Your Honor, we don't. Why not? Uh, well, for uh, <coughs> several reasons. Uh, one reason is that in any uh, balancing analysis, it is very difficult to, de to determine in an objective way what values are on either side of the scale and find some way to make them commensurate. Second, when product design decisions are made, the people who are developing the products frequently don't know what they would have to know in order to make the balance. That is to say, in order to determine whether the effect on competition Decision. You can't just bolt them together, whatever that means. You uh, have to have I, some plausible technological benefit. Th that is, so that is correct. Some examination right there, isn't there? That is correct. And, uh, and the, uh, the 
third reason I was going to advance, if I may, which I think addresses that uh, in part, is that the history of development, at least on the Windows platform, which is an open platform that thousands of developers build applications for, is that there has been no foreclosure of competing technologies on account of the incorporation of Microsoft technologies in the operating system. So for example, when Microsoft uh, included Internet Explorer in Windows, uh, in the initial iteration of Windows 95, it immediately met competition from Netscape, which notwithstanding the fact that IE1 and IE2 were part of Windows, took 80% of usage share. Netscape took 80% of usage share. See, but what I'm trying to understand is you don't argue that Section 1 has no applicability no, to I do not. software. No, I do not argue that. And what I'm asking is why aren't the concerns that you have adequately addressed by a slightly more rigorous test so that you don't get subject to the criticism that, well, software company can always come up with some plausible explanation. And in other words, you become exempt from the strictures of the time. And, and, and what I was trying to uh, uh, say in addressing that is that in light of the fact that there is no foreclosure because of inclusion of these features, because others can compete with the feature that the test doesn't need to be any stricter than it is. And there's example after example after example in the record of this case on it. Apple QuickTime, multimedia playback uh, software, which competes with Windows on the Windows platform, the corresponding Microsoft technology is DirectX. Uh, Real Networks streaming media, which is a different kind of uh, multimedia uh, uh, technology competes on the Windows platform directly with the operating system technology uh, in Windows. And I, I could adduce other examples. So if there's no foreclosure, if there can be open competition on the Windows platform with uh, operating system technology, and where in some cases, such as the early case of Navigator, the, uh, the external provider of the software literally takes the whole or close to the whole market, then it isn't clear to me why we need to become involved in a stricter test which will involve more imponderables and particularly items that are imponderable if as you look into the future, which any product planner has to do, it's relatively easy, though not easy, to apply those tests, even retrospectively. But trying to employ them prospectively is virtually impossible. I think that under the standard that was articulated by this court in June 1998, which was uh, a standard that required Microsoft, among other things, to demonstrate that there had been an integration and that it carried with it certain plausible benefits, uh, that uh, Microsoft has clearly, pre clearly prevailed under that test. Uh, 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 there are many uh, benefits to Microsoft's integrated design of Windows 98. Let me just identify four. Uh, first, uh, Internet Explorer components of Windows expose APIs that permit developers to write web-enabled applications. Let me give you an example of that. Probably the most popular web-enabled uh, application is Intuit's Quicken, which is a personal finance uh, application package. And what uh, Internet Explorer permits Quicken to do is 
go out onto the internet and bring back current financial information, which is then embedded in Quicken, processed, and displayed in the Quicken window. All of this is seamless, meaning that the user doesn't even know that it isn't Quicken that is doing all this, but rather Quicken invoking the elements of Internet Explorer. Now, this is an example of something that Navigator cannot do. It is a monolithic application. But that's not, that's not the question whether Navigator can do it. I, I'd like to I make that point for two reasons, Judge Randolph. One is that under the June uh, 1998 decision, I believe that there was a requirement uh, in specifically in this arena that the benefit was not one that could be achieved by combining the operating system with a, quote, standalone browser, close quote, like Quicken. And that's one of the reasons I make the point. Another reason I make the point is in response to uh, an argument that was made this morning that essentially Microsoft doesn't benefit anymore by having uh, users uh, employ Internet Explorer rather than uh, Navigator. But I the thought the test was whether you could achieve, whether, whether by, install, by putting the two products together, and forming a third product, that Microsoft achieved something that the individual consumer could not achieve by, by installing the product separately. Which I think is essentially the same test that I just articulated, that you, you can't, the, the, the focus on the consumer being that if the consumer could achieve the same result by taking a standalone browser and running it on the operating. I stopped you. You were going to give us four. You've only managed one. I just want to make sure, are any of the four benefits that you're mentioning now, are any of them among the 19 that the, uh, I can't remember the name, Alchin? Was it? Uh, Mr. Alchin, yes. Right. Was cross-examined about and admitted all 19 were... Uh, benefits that could be achieved by installing separately? Are any of the four no, no, you no. mentioned? These are all benefits that are covered in Mr. Alchin's testimony, but his testimony is not that these can be achieved by running a standalone browser on Windows. His testimony on cross-examination is that you can achieve most of the benefits, not all, but most of the benefits of Windows 98 by installing IE4 on Windows 95, but of course that testimony proves absolutely nothing of any consequence because installing IE4 on Windows 95 is just a way of having Microsoft go in, tear out old operating system files, and replace them with new files that extend the functionality of the operating system. In other words, you're rebuilding the operating system or updating the operating system on the computer. Uh, let me proceed to the other three I was going to mention. Uh, one, uh, there are two very popular features on Windows 98. One is the Windows Update, which permits users to uh, update their operating systems by going out to a, a Microsoft website on the World Wide Web and having the website search the user's computer to make sure it has all components that are up to the moment, and if they're not up to the moment, the website will automatically download and update the user's uh, operating system. So your view of the word plausible <laughs> means more than coming up with uh, a minor distinction. You're talking about real, tangible, technological advancements that could not be achieved by combining two independent products. I'm not sure that that is the intention of the author of the 1998 opinion. No, but my what point I'm is exactly well, how you're interpreting it. I mean, you're giving us very solid, major, in my words, uh, advances. Because that the consumer I, could not develop 
because I think we passed the test with flying colors here. It's not a close case. But that doesn't mean that the standard needs to be or should be made more severe for the reasons I alluded to earlier, well, Your Honor. In response to Judge Randolph's question, you said Mr. Alchin was simply talking about Windows 95 and uh, IE4. Um, would that pass the test? Yeah, I, I believe that was, in, in fact, the holding of the June 1998 decision, uh, albeit in a preliminary way because it was the appeal of a preliminary. Well, I thought that decision, though, focused a lot on the fact that Windows 95 you know, it was a totally new product for all kinds of different reasons. So that the standard for plausibility, you're saying, if I understand you correctly, is, is quite significant. Is quite significant. I think it is significant, but I don't think that it requires uh, product improvements of the dimension of the ones that I've just mentioned in order to uh, well, I'm be satisfied. I'm trying to understand where the line is. I think the line is here. The benefit to consumers has to be plausible. That means it has to appear on its face as a benefit. And the benefit is not, under the 1998 decision, a, quote, net benefit, close quote, that then would engender in the trial courts endless proceedings about whether, on balance, in view of legions of experts, the product is truly better, or whether, from somebody's point of view, uh, it's better in some ways, worse in other ways, and we have judicial administration of product design. I think that was intended not to be the outcome of the of the uh, of the uh, June 1998 decision. Uh, the additional uh, benefits I'll just point to are the HTML help sy help system in Windows 98. Uh, third. Uh, so, so your position is that this court is free to ignore the emphasis in Jefferson Parish on <laughs> consumer demand. Because, Is that correct? Because Jefferson Parish didn't deal with integrated products. I understand that. Uh, but trying to get some instruction from the court as to what are the relevant considerations. And you're saying that is simply not a relevant consideration? That's correct. Because you can meet demand for product A and product B by an integrated product. You meet both elements of demand by an integrated, more technically advanced product. Uh, the third benefit I want to draw the court, court's attention to is that uh, in Windows 98, the IE, or Internet Explorer, components uh, generate the user interface, including the Start button and the icons on the desktop. And fourth, they also provide for seamless browsing between information sources of all kinds in a single window using the navigational paradigms of the World Wide Web, which is basically forward and backward uh, and uh, working from lists of favorites and uh, lists of histories. This is essentially a rationalization of the user interface so that the user doesn't have to uh, use one kind of method to secure information that's on his hard disk, use another method to gather, get information from the web, open another window to get information from the local area network. It's designed to simplify and make the technology more uh, useful to individuals. Uh, uh, nor uh, is uh, this, nor is the integration in Windows 98 subject to the bolting exception uh, that this court identified in the 1998 decision. Uh, this, uh, the, the integration in Windows 98 is not simply conjoining uh, previously existing blocks of code. It is the development of code that performs multiple functions including displaying HTML pages from the World Wide Web, including displaying the user interface, which is itself in HTML, uh, and so forth. 
Suppose we, uh, suppose we don't agree with you that we're bound by Microsoft II here. I mean, it was a consent decree case. We're sitting on bank. Uh, suppose we think we're bound, we're still bound by Jefferson Parish. If you thought you were still bound by Jefferson Parish, then I think you would nevertheless have to conclude for two entirely separate reasons that this was not an unlawful tie-in under Section 1. The first reason is that there is no foreclosure of rivals of the tied product. It's crystal clear in footnote 34 in Jefferson Parish and the text which it elucidates that foreclosure, which is almost always an accompaniment of a tie-in arrangement, is a requirement for application of the per se rule. Is that the same as, are you essentially arguing there that there's no substantial effect on commerce? Is that, no. are you invoking that arm of the Jefferson Parish test? No, no? I'm, argu I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't mean no, to. No, go ahead. I, yeah. uh, I'm arguing that there is no foreclosure of rival products, period. I'm not addressing the jurisdictional requirement of the statute that there be more than a negligible amount of interstate commerce affected. I'm saying that foreclosure of a rival of the putative tied product is a requirement uh, of the of per se tying offense under Section 1. And I think the Supreme Court makes that point with indelible clarity uh, at footnote 34 of Jefferson Parish. Uh, the second reason I don't believe uh, that uh, the integration of this technology into uh, 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 Windows uh, can be deemed a tying arrangement is that tying typically, and I think under the cases, must entail the forced purchase of a second product uh, uh, by uh, the consumer. And since uh, Internet Explorer is given away as part of Windows and over the internet and probably in half a dozen other ways, there isn't the forced purchase of a second product. I don't really, I don't understand that argument at all. I mean, it, the, uh, under, under the arrangements with the OEMs, a person who bought Windows bought IE. But it seems to me in, in the sort of classic tying uh, terminology, that's a forced purchase. The Supreme the, I mean, the, the, the fact that, it, that the consumer can get IE or Netscape free through some other means is a is highly relevant and interesting phenomenon, but it doesn't seem to me that it uh, negates the proposition that uh, IE came along automatically with Windows. Came along automatically free with Windows. The district court repeatedly finds in its findings that Microsoft made Internet Explorer available. Isn't that, no isn't that just a restatement of the proposition that the two items, call them item, not products, were bundled, right? When, when, when uh, items are bundled physically and in price, uh, you buy one, you get the other. That, that's, in many respects, what the forcing under Jefferson Parish means. Uh, I think that's not quite so clear. In Jefferson Parish, the Supreme Court notes that there was a separately stated charge for anesthesiological services, and it relies on that finding in the holding. And That's part of its general comparison of, of uh, the different practices in the field as between, for example, radiology and anesthesiology. Uh, or other services provided by the hospital, such as medicine, nursing care, and so on. I don't think the Supreme Court was suggesting in Jefferson Parish that we now have to turn hospitals, that you go in with a menu and bring your own nurse and your own dietician. And somebody <laughs> the conclusion on nurses and dietitians and radiologists and so forth was not that they weren't tied, but that they were fundamentally the same product. So that, in other words, it would seem to me that the correct reading of Jefferson Parish is that, sure, there's a uh, certain forcing, but where that represents the way in which 
all competitors in the market operate, it's okay. Well, in any event, the Supreme Court appears to have thought it was significant that there was a separate, separately stated charge uh, for the service found to be uh, a separate product in that case. Uh, and although I might agree with your honor that in certain cases we would have to allocate in some very complicated uh, cost accounting way a value sure. to every feature, oh, that may be impossible, uh, it, to every feature of every product, it's not all that persuasive an argument in a situation where the feature is at the same time being given away free by half a dozen other means. Uh, if I may, uh, I think I'd oh, like isn't to there still a cost to the consumer? I mean, it, let's assume you're right that Explorer is totally free. The consumer who wants Navigator instead still has to go get it. And the cost for doing that may be minimal, but there's still a cost, and there's capacity on the computer that's used up. So for the consumer who wants Navigator or some other browser, it isn't free. Well, the cost of Navigator, once it faced serious competition, was zero. No, I understand. I'm talking about the cost of the time it takes to get it. I mean, it, it, it may be not much, but there may be consumers who are, who are sufficiently discouraged from downloading it so that they don't do it. There are many ways cost. other than downloading to secure it, and there is every reason to believe that any computer user that wanted that product could get it. W with great respect, Your Honor, there are three central characteristics, economic characteristics of software distribution. It's easy, fast, and cheap. So those aren't technical terms. <laughs> Mr. Clark, the founder of Netscape, testified that downloading software from the internet was the best distribution system ever devised by human wit because it's so fast, so easy, and so cheap, and so pervasive. One of the reasons the software industry is as competitive as it is is that you can't stop people from distributing software. They can get it to the whole market, and they can do it almost instantly. Uh, if I may, I'd like to reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal. Please, the court. Let's begin with the basic question of which test controls. The test <coughs> articulated by the panel in the uh, consent decree appeal, or the test articulated by the Supreme Court in Jefferson Parish and Eastman Kodak. The panel majority in Microsoft 2, the consent decree appeal, stated no fewer than four times in its opinion that it was construing a consent decree and not interpreting a statute. We think the court meant that. In footnote 14, the panel majority in Microsoft 2 said that the consent decree does not bar an action under the Sherman Act. We think the court meant that. The particular provision that the court was called upon to construe in Microsoft 2 referred to integrated products. It was therefore natural for the court to attempt to develop a test for integrated products. Under Jefferson Parish and Eastman Kodak, that is not the pertinent question. The question is whether there is sufficient consumer demand so that it is efficient for a firm to offer the products separately. The panel in Microsoft 2, because it was construing a consent decree, was not bound by Jefferson Parish or Eastman Kodak. This court today, confronting the question of the Sherman Act, is. In addition, the panel in Microsoft 2 recognized that it was dealing with a very incomplete factual record. It was dealing with an improvidently, improperly noticed preliminary injunction. And it specifically said that its conclusions were, quote, subject to reconsideration on a more complete factual record. We now have that more complete factual record. And in a number of very particular respects, that factual record calls into question some of the assumptions that were made by the panel majority in Microsoft 2. No fault of theirs, it was an incomplete factual record. I'll take one example to start with. 
panel in Microsoft 2 addressed the question of separating the browser Internet Explorer from the operating system and said if you do that, really all you're doing is taking out four lines of code. That doesn't look like a separate product. It looks like a key to get into Internet Explorer. Finding of fact 185 explains that if you run the Felton program to remove browser functionality, it's not just four lines that are left behind. What is left is sufficient code that doesn't have to be loaded when you boot up Windows from the hard drive to the RAM that to, to have Windows 98 take up 20% less RAM when it's booted up. So that may start to look like enough to be considered a separate product. The court in, in Microsoft 2 focused on how Internet Explorer code was shared with operating system code. Mr. Roberts, can you reasonably argue that there is a separate market for browserless operating systems? Findings of fact 149 to 150. I'm looking at them right now, and I've read them over and over again. And I, because, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm thinking too much about what I think I know as opposed to focusing on the record, so I'm being honest with you, all right? I, it seems to me, I won't say in its absurd proposition, it's a, very, it's a highly questionable proposition for anyone to now suggest that there is a separate market for a browserless operating system, in part because all operating systems include browsers, and for lots of other reasons. It's, it's a fairly absurd proposition. So I was very curious to figure out what the district court opinion had to say about that. And I must say, as I traced what I think are a number of speculative observations about the district court, I can't find any underlying hard information to back up the inference. There's no clear finding. There's some speculation about inconvenience and <coughs> employers don't like to have uh, the Internet available to employees. There's no data that I can find. Now, maybe it's there, and you can point me to it. Well, there's two, two separate points, and I want to distinguish between them. The first is the, the precise question you asked. Is there a market for a browserless operating system? Right, and where's the data to support that? But the second point, uh, which is related, and they follow sequentially in the findings, do consumers want to choose their operating system separately from choosing their browser? Mm -hmm. And there was the testimony, for example, of the representative from Boeing, that they, like, they use different operating systems. They want a standard browser, so they don't want to buy them together. They want to choose them separately. Now, the district court did find that there's sufficient consumer demand for a browserless operating system, particularly referring, as Your Honor did, to companies that their employees have no business surfing the web, or they may in some circumstances, but, but uh, in, in not others. So they want some without a browser. For the, for, the oper for the makers of operating systems who were willing to remove the browser, did they offer any discount? I'm not aware of that, Your Honor. I do the, know. The, I mean, I, I think that uh, I think Professor Schmalensee's contention on that is, has no rebuttal. Well, I, uh, the, the government has done nothing to call my attention to any rebuttal material. The, first of all, those companies, that constitutes every other company besides Windows. That's right. Uh, besides Microsoft. Microsoft was the only company that no, no, forced the tie. Let, let's focus for a moment, and it's really what I was struggling with Mr. Araski on. Um, in, in terms of pricing, which after all is very important in these things, uh, the purchasers from other operating system makers were, in fact, required to take the option of a browser. Isn't that correct? They were, al no, they were allowed to remove the browser from the operating but system. But they, they, uh, when they got the operating system, they got with it an entitlement to the browser, right? Correct. Now, the, it seems to me Jefferson Parish and the other time cases are reasonably clear concern is about this forcing of the uh, consumer because once having paid for an item, it's silly to go buy another. There was great concern in Jefferson Parish explicitly about the poor competitor who was trying to break into that market uh, and has a hard time doing so because the person who's, got the, who's bought the tying good already has the tied product. Isn't that correct? 
Well, that's correct, but there is evidence on the market, and there's no need to speculate. I understand you're arguing that there are different, different contract clauses between Microsoft and the other producers. But the, the basic theme, it seems to me, of, of Jefferson Parish and the looking at separate demand is to, to ask the question, uh, are competitive, and this is the Aretha reading of the test, uh, are competitive sellers also bundling the item? If they are, the belief is that competition is taking care of this, and the forcing that is going on, the fact that people find themselves in possession uh, of one maker's product, is therefore innocent or at least not covered by per se. I, I think that's the critical point, and it's a difference between bundling, combining, and forcing. There is no problem with Microsoft putting together the operating system and the browser and offering it as one package. But the that, problem... But that, uh, that act alone, <coughs> in, the, in terms of the pricing concerns that have historically driven tying law, ends the case. You're moving in a new territory of a, of a peculiar situation where the, where the defendant has said, in a sense, you can't throw it away, or we're going to make it slightly hard for you to throw it away. You're going to have to move the icon on your machine. But uh, that, that, uh, that kind of thing has not driven tying law at all. You're taking tying law into new and interesting territory. No, I, with respect, Your Honor, I think not. And I think uh, Kodak, and in particular, and Jefferson Parish as well, point out this critical distinction. The question is not show us the benefits from a combination. In your hypothetical, I agree. and you say, well, the other Let's manufacturers, look at market practices. Market practices. the other manufacturers um, uh, do offer them together. And, but there, and therefore, it follows that the someone who isn't in a position to tie it, the independent seller of the tied good, is cut off at the knees. No. The difference is that no other vendor requires them to be kept together. And that's important. And if you look back at the... Maybe important for your uh, Section monopoly two. maintenance Section 2 argument, question, but not, not on, on the time. tying question. Oh, it certainly is. It's, it, is the, it is the forcing aspect that raises the tie. Do you, do you have any tying case that turns on some sort of requirement that the consumer actually keep possession of the tied good as opposed to being forced to buy it? It's not a, que a question of keep possession. It's a question well, of well, whether Jefferson they're Parish. free. Why isn't Jefferson Parish? I mean, there's not a big market for surgery without anesthesia, is there? No. <laughs> <laughs> or even, so even it, the other way around. For anesthesia right. without surgery. It, so if we give you the package, I mean, you, you can do away with the anesthesia if you want to and have <laughs> your operation, but... Uh, and but that, but that is the key distinction because it is, and we need to emphasize, it is not the combination. Giving the package, there's nothing wrong with that. Preventing the OEMs from taking but off the icon in response to consumer demand. That's what the consumers you, wanted. Let me give you a hypo, Mr. Yeah, Let's see whether you think it's a tying it. case. Suppose that uh, Microsoft that offered the operating system with IE. It said you can take it off, throw it away, do whatever you like with it, erase the code. But it had plugged into uh, the operating system, a few lines of code that as soon as Navigator was added caused the entire system to collapse, right? Disaster. <laughs> Terribly unfair competition and probably antitrust violation of some sort. Not a tie. Well, Not a tie. Unless, it were, unless it were analyzed as a so-called reverse tie. In other words, as soon as you try to if you do try to add something else, it's, it, you have a disaster. I think that would probably be what's called a reverse tie, like the uh, Lorraine Journal case. But again, if I could just emphasize the important distinction. Combination is fine. And that's why all this argument about, oh, this is going to chill innovation, how do we tell what to do? You combine to your heart's content. But the problem comes in when you say, and you, the OEMs who are sensitive to consumer demand, you can't take that off even if that's, as the facts show, what the uh, consumers want. Well, if I, you look I didn't back hear, then, your answer to Judge Randolph. What is the answer to the hospital case? The, the, the hospital did not allow the patient to say, okay, I'll pay for the anesthesiology, but I want to get my own. I'll pay you for yours, but I want to throw it away and bring in my own. That wasn't allowed. That's right. That, that, was, that, that, that was forcing. 
um, uh, and if given proper market power in that case, they, they, they recognized that they were dealing with separate products. If you go back and look at the, the older so-called technology tying cases, Berkey Photo, Telex case out of Oklahoma and some of those, that language from those cases is often quoted for the proposition that courts need to be reluctant and not enmesh themselves in design decisions. And that's right. But in those cases, the, uh, the, the vendor continued marketing the standalone products. Who, who so won Jefferson Parish? It was found not to be, not to be a violation, but, I, right. but it was not because they were not separate products. The court held that they are separate products. And, and as, as I was saying in the Berkey photo situation, the distinction is they continued to market them as standalone products, so they were letting the market decide. Yeah, but the other, the other uh, operating system makers are not mar marketing operating systems as standalone products. True, they're more permissive than Microsoft in letting you destroy the extra code or, or they remove it in advance, whatever the system is, but you pay for it. So you are in exactly the position that the court in Jefferson Parish is very concerned about. The consumer finds himself with the tied good and therefore has no interest in a competitor's version of it. But there's no forcing. There's no forcing to keep <laughs> that, and that makes the bundling. The uh, price bundle is the forcing, and the other producers do it equally. And the practice of the other competitive sellers in the market is enough, for example, in distinguishing radiology for the court to regard that as uh, a single product. There was separate demand, there were, as the court found, consumer demand for the products separately. Microsoft. Which it did by looking at the practices of the sellers. Right. Right. No, it's It isn't a matter of whether there are consumers out there who say, oh, I'd like a car without a radio. I'd like a car with, I'd like a GM car with a Ford radio. It's what do the producers actually do? And what the producers do in this field is to include some, are, some of them offering the option of deleting the extra that's tied not, item. That's not the way the Supreme but Court For no at discount, it. no discount. That's not the way the Supreme Court looked at it in Jefferson Parish. They did ask patients, they, they, and they asked doctors, do you want a separate anesthesiologist from that provider? To some extent. The they, cer they certainly looked at the behavior uh, of competing firms with respect to anesthesiology as opposed to the other things which they distinguish. And certainly the Aretha reading of the test is to look at what firms and competition do uh, as a sign that if there's profit to be made by separating them, firms and competition will do it. Well, the, uh, Jefferson Parish looked to consumer demand, the ultimate consumer. That's what the findings are. Large, largely reflected in the behavior of the providers. Well, they reflected in the, uh, I mean, we're dealing with doctor's recommendations, if that's what Your Honor means, rather than the patient, but, but their, their, their consumer preferences. And that's, of course, what, what Jefferson Parish and Eastman Kodak say. You look Throughout, for this consumer let, demand. Let me, let me ask you again so that you can, you can help me. I mean, this is one of the cases, for, one of the places for me where the failure of the findings of fact to point to any record citations makes it very, very difficult on appellate review because they're very conclusory statements here that I tried to trace to determine whether there was any real data to support the observation that there is a market for browserless operating systems. It's certainly not intuitive given that all of the operating systems offer browsers that can be removed or deleted. But, you know, see, in making your argument that in all the other cases they can be removed and therefore Microsoft is forcing, you're ignoring Microsoft's counter argument, which is they don't integrate as deeply. <coughs> and but in any event, make that your second answer. Tell me if there is any data to back up. I, quite frankly, in my, I hear my colleagues in the first part of this argument that we are supposed to defer to factual findings. But when I find factual findings that look very conclusory and there's no citation to anything, I don't think my obligation as an appellate court is to defer to them. So what, are the, what is the data? I, I would refer the court primarily to the government's proposed findings of fact, which are sort of an annotated uh, uh, compilation of the evidence that supports the proposed findings. Uh, I remember offhand the Boeing example. There is testimony from Boeing. We want a browser list or anything other than Boeing because that's yes, the only one. Yes, yeah, that, I, I cited it's, it's the one I recall. They're detailed uh, in the proposed findings of fact. I think that's where I would look 
find the underlying evidence. But I don't understand Microsoft to contend that those findings are clearly erroneous. What they contend is they're beside the point because they have a different focus. They say we're going to put these together and because there are benefits, it's not separate products. And that approach has been definitively rejected by the Supreme Court. In Kodak, they dealt with it specifically. They said... But, yeah, but, the given, but given the present developments that, that Judge Edwards is talking about, I mean, it's almost like you're, you're saying, I'd like to buy a clock radio without a clock. No, I, I think I, there's not. A, and, that's, and that's a tied product under your theory because so even though they're technologically integrated, there's separate markets for clocks and separate markets for radio. And it makes a difference to consumers. Um, uh, the OEMs were telling Microsoft that people want Navigator. So let us take IE off. No, no. So, see, the people wanting Navigator is a different question. And that does go to your Section 2 claim. Well, it also it goes doesn't prove to me anything about whether there's a true separate market for browserless operating systems. Well, the browserless operating systems, those are, again, addressed in the findings of fact, and our proposed findings of fact details the evidence in the record that supports that. They refer to companies that don't have a use for the browser. Their employees are not supposed to be using the browser, let, so let get me, one without it. Yeah, let me ask you about that one point, Mr. Roberts. There's two kinds, presumably there's two kinds of purchasers who end up with a browser they don't want, right? One is browsers of the kind, or consumers of the time kind you're talking about who don't want one at all. And then there are consumers who want a different browser, right? Correct. Okay, the ones who don't want it at all, uh, there's this language in Jefferson Parish which suggests that, I mean, while that may be a harm to the consumer, it's not a harm to competition because they wouldn't buy one otherwise. That's right, and we don't so think that So what do that we do that with that language? Well, that doesn't show impact in the tied product market, but we do think it's pertinent to deciding whether there are separate products. Eye on consumers who don't want a browser to show foreclosure in the tied product market. The consumers who do want a browser. Consumers who do want a different browser. A different browser. Which they can then get free, as it turns out. Well, it turns out, as the, as the district court emphasized, that the key to usage, and it's important to recognize that distinction, millions of uh, uh, downloading and all that, that's not the important point. Usage is what's important in terms of whether it has the potential to become a competing platform for software applications. And it, the district court specifically found if you're out of the OEM channel, if you're not in the box that the consumer buys, that's going to affect usage. And the OEMs were not interested in putting two browsers on the products because, again, the findings of fact are clear. That takes away their profit no, no, margin. But, but, but the consumer has access to the, to the alternative browser at, at no charge, right? The consumer so has if you're, you're, access, So if we're just yes, fo focusing on the question of whether, whether the tie forecloses access by the consumer, the answer is no, right? Findings of fact 239 to 241 point out that Microsoft was successful in foreclosing Navigator's access to the OEM channel. That's where it the OEM difference. channel. But the question is, were they foreclo foreclosing consumers from getting it? No, and and the impact on consumers is made at the point of the OEM channel. That is the way this business works. You, if you're not going to get on the computer, the fact that you could get a browser from somewhere. Well, else. now remember, we're talking only about consumers who wanted the other browser, right? We, we crossed that bridge a moment ago. In the terms ones who, the in ones terms who of didn't want Navigator are irrelevant. The ones who want Navigator are the ones we're looking at. And they, and they can get it. To and then you've got this statement. Let me ask you what you do with it in Jefferson Parish. Well, I read it earlier. The evidence indicates that some surgeons and patients preferred respondent services to those of Rue, but there's no evidence that any patient who was sophisticated enough to know the difference between the two anesthesiologists was not also able to go to a hospital that would provide him with the anesthesiologist of his choice. You see the parallel. What we do with that is, is to rely on the findings of fact which show that the, the, what is available as a practical matter to consumers is decided by the OEM channel. Microsoft oh, but, oh, wait a minute. To the consumers who want Navigator. Those well, are the only ones know. we're interested in, I right? Mean, that's where, but the competition is snuffed out because they don't know. There would be no objection 
the OEM. So, so does does Microsoft have an obligation to tell them, or simply to to not get out, of, not get in their way if they want to access it? Microsoft has an obligation not to tie separate products as a means of forcing Navigator out of the OEM distribution channel, which is exactly what channel to consumers who want Navigator. By definition, they, they must already know. know about it, or they couldn't want it. No, uh, Your Honor, that's not correct. Our point is that there should be competition to decide what is the browser that consumers want. And what Microsoft was unwilling to engage in that competition, and we know exactly why. They said so in their documents. We're not going to win. So we have to, quote, uh, uh, it's important to leverage the OS asset to make people use IE instead of Navigator. Now, if they don't know that Navigator would be a better choice, that doesn't mean that their, their benefits of competition are not also lost to them, because Microsoft is leveraging the OS asset to make people use IE. It would have been perfectly all right if they'd offered the package and said you can compete. But by It's an interesting forcing, question, Mr. Rudd. Is there a loss of consumer surplus when the consumer doesn't know it? I guess that's the question. I think, it, I guess my answer would be yes. I mean, the, the, there's not a, a, no great benefit to ignorance. And there is a loss well, but, of competition. But, 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 but wait a minute. But, but, but the consumer can't have a loss of something it, 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 would, it values if it doesn't know that it exists. Well, the, right? the overriding harm, of course, is the fortification of the application's barrier to entry that protects that Microsoft. Was the Microsoft. That's yeah. not a tying. Yeah. Right. That's it's not right. a tying argument at all. The tying argument is that argument. by the tie, they were able to force Navigator out of these distribution yeah. channels. Yeah. You, may, you may have a claim uh, entirely based on the, the particular way in which IE was included in the monopoly maintenance, but it's not a tying claim. You're, you're relying on a per se rule. What, what do you see as the functions of a per se rule? Well, why, why, why I does think the court the set aside a narrow group of, a narrow type of conduct for per se treatment? The district court didn't even address the question. No, no, I'm, it's a question of law. It has nothing to do with it. Whether, you know, whether per se Why is, why is per se, uh, why, why is there a special rule for per se tying? Because the court can assume that there's going to be an impact on competition. Okay. Now here, can, can, the, can the court make that assumption very validly when it uh, mechanically applies uh, rules derived from areas where the idea of the consumer throwing the thing away is unthinkable? In this You're case, a pioneer. In this you case, take credit for it. No, Your Honor. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to get the court to apply what we think are unambiguous guidelines of determining separate products set forth in Jefferson Parish and Eastman Kodak. The uh, harm to, to establish the tying case, and it satisfies on the facts of this case the rule of reason approach or the per se approach, which is why that's not an issue on which the parties have joined or the district court made any conclusions. It's not necessary. There is sufficient foreclosure in the market for the tied product. I mentioned the operating system monopoly simply to emphasize that this is not one of those areas of tying where all the economists say you're silly to worry about it because there's only one monopoly rent or anything like that. And that is because the browser represented an innovative threat to the application's barrier to entry. That was the point the district court... Back to section two. I'm just explaining why this tie in particular is of particular concern to the governments. I don't it's understand how, you, how you think the mere tie itself forecloses market entry. I, because it's the, the additional acts that are the subject of Section 2 that may or, you may or may not be right on. We, we certainly understand your argument there. But the mere tie does not foreclose Netscape from being a competitor and being a viable competitor. The district court may be found these other that it things. did for this reason. Well, the district court, like I say, there are some findings that are merely just conclusions, and they're, 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 I find no basis for them. So I'm not in that camp that says because a district court lists something under findings of fact, it's gospel. Well, it has to be a fact in fact. It has to be supported by and something. And it's got to be supported by something other than the mere statement of the district court. And what the district court said that is plainly supported by the fact. Microsoft's documents explain that they won the browser war. I mean, we're not making up the fact that Navigator is out in the cold and IE is, has steadily increasing usage share while Navigator's goes down. That's ignoring the reality. And the reality is clearly documented in the district court's findings that say, for example, they're only in four of 60 OEM channels. In January 99. Wasn't the district court wasn't saying that, I don't think, or so, explain to me how so, 
by virtue of the mere what you call tie. Oh no, it, it was, was a because of it was because of the alleged section two predatory conduct. The combination of all of the conduct, certainly. However, the foreclosure from the tie comes from the simple fact, and and we may not think it's it's correct, or we may think it is, but the district court found that an OEM is not going to put two browsers on the machine, and that most people who open up the box on Christmas morning are going to look and see if it has a browser. They're not going to go shopping for another browser once it has is, a browser. Is it a general principle that an OEM will not put two on? I mean, is that sort of the way the gravity works? No, it, what the district court found <laughs> is that it caused consumer confusion. Um, so, in effect, some OEMs were reluctant put two on. I mean, no, the that's really, in, in terms of, yeah, but I'm looking, looking beyond the, the conclusory terms. The actual evidence was some OEMs were reluctant to put two on. Even, of course, they, it was we, have to, we have to assume they would have some affirmative motive to do so, right, before we even have to worry about it. Oh, they so did. So presumably it's only among the set of OEMs who have a desire to put Navigator on independently that we're concerned. Well, their, their motive was to respond to consumer demand. And the, it's not just some. The court gave a reason. Uh, and the reason is one that would apply across the board. That if you find when you've got two on, it causes confusion. People call up. They say, well, there are two browsers there. Which one am I supposed to use sort of thing? And if you get three phone calls from one user, you've lost your profit on the machine. So it's not worth their while. Now, that affects the, the, the benefits of competition for the consumer. What, what is there, are there any data about how many <coughs> uh, beyond the three calls per consumer? In other words, if you get three calls per consumer, you lose the profit on the unit you sold to that consumer. Right? When they had experience with two browsers, to the extent there was any experience, did, did they find out how many, call, how many buyers out of 1,000 call? No, I, I don't, I'm not aware that So if you lose your evidence. profit on that unit, but that unit is just a few units out of millions, what's the difference? Well, we, we have to assume and it's, uh, that we're dealing with companies that are going to be acting rationally. If there were no costs to putting two browsers on, then the OEMs would put two browsers on. But there were costs. And the district court found, finding of fact 159, Microsoft knew that. That's why they undertook this browser war. And they were going to win the browser war by increasing the usage of IE. And they increased the usage of IE by tying it to the operating system that every OEM had to put Could on Could Microsoft their lawfully uh, <coughs> bundle both IE and Netscape? I, I, don't, I don't know that there are other browsers out there, but I think the answer is, would, would be no. And in any event, they were still going to be separate products. And they're separate products because the consumer but demand for them is by separate. By, by the logic of your case, I think you have to, it has to be yes. That's that, they could separate, that if they bundled them both in, there's no foreclosure of Netscape. Well, I, I, I was assuming that the same rules applied and you were not allowed to remove uh, anything. No. In other words, it's yeah. not just yeah. a bundling, right. it's right. a combination. There's nothing wrong with them putting together whatever combination they want. It is the forcing aspect that becomes the problem, saying you, you, we put it together and you can't take it off. Right. You have to leave Netscape on. We'd still be here. You have to leave it on. Now, if there were some reason people wanted to take it off, there could be a tying case, but it, it may not meet the other requirements of, of tying, but it wouldn't fail because they were not separate products. Browser and the operating system are separate products because there's separate consumer demand for them, right. and this is key, and, and it's but efficient. You also argue that if we apply our opinion of Microsoft to you when on that score? It certainly is a steeper hill to climb, but I think the, that we can still prevail I'd like for to know, this I, reason. Could you make the attempt? Because I'm sure. not clear. The opinion in Microsoft 2 construed the consent decree provision uh, uh, providing for integrated products to say there has to be plausible, plausibly, facially plausible benefits. I think the first question is, well, benefits to whom? The district court found that the combination presented no benefits to the people who wanted a browserless operating system. Found that it introduced degradation and bugs. The district court specifically did, did found... He, I can't remember. Did he address the non-browser functions which occupy almost all the code in IE? Well, yes, and it turns out it doesn't... He said they don't want any of those functions either? Oh, no. The, he recognized, based on finding of fact 149, 
that consumers buy machines for functions, not for code. Yeah. You mm -hmm. don't go to the store and say, I want a machine that has code in it. You go in and say, I want a browser. Did, did he acknowledge that, they, that these consumers not wanting a browser wanted the, the code that provided the non-browser functions in IE? And he found that it was easy, finding a fact 177 from Dr. Felton, it is easy to remove browser functionality without affecting that underlying code. Well, that's, that's just um, I explore Excel. Oh, uh, oh, 62 kilobytes, it's nothing. And, and the finding of fact 185 said when you do that, it is something. That makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense to say oh, that removal that of lines of code that amount to 62 kilobytes is 20% of the program. That's because when you remove the functionality, it turns out there is code that doesn't have to be uh, summoned from the hard drive to the RAM when Windows 98 boots up. That's what Dr. Felton explained. And besides, Dr. Felton was just showing that this could be done. Presumably, Microsoft would do it in a different way that might show that there's more commingled code, yeah, but, but, less but shared if, code. If consumers want the four libraries that are the bulk of IE, uh, your, your proposed tie doesn't give them any particular, uh, your, your solution to the supposed tie doesn't give them anything of any value. Because they've still got, Certainly they've, st does. they've still got the six megs of hard drive occupied. And whenever they use these browser functions, they'll bring them to life. Well, what Felton showed is that you could remove browser functionality without compromising Windows 9 Absolutely. operating system. That was the four lines of code. Right, and it, but it Which turns was the out stipulation that uh, the department and Microsoft reached in 1998. And the it, compliance with the injunction, even though it spoke of removing IE altogether, could in fact be solved entirely by deleting four lines of code. And one of the consequences of that, and this is finding of fact 185, supported at Joint Appendix page 976, is that there is more left there of Internet Explorer when you remove the four lines that everything else is not shared with Windows 98. I, I'm, I'm a little, oh, you're, what you're talking about is that it was, these findings deal with whether it was technologically feasible to, to get rid of internet, to, to sell a browserless Windows. To, to remove browser but, functionality. But, yes. but the question I think Microsoft 2 poses is not that. It's whether there's a benefit to consumers. Uh, 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 well, you well, you may be able to remove an air conditioner from a car, and the car will function properly. But you can't deny that a car with an air conditioner <coughs> provides a benefit to consumers. And, that, and so that, it's the affirmative question. Fi findings of fact 188 and 199 show that, there is th that the, the combination can be done as effectively by the ultimate consumer. That's the uh, in Alchin's cross-examination. This is the 19 yes. points in cross-examination? Yes. Now, I'm not sure that, that that would meet the test of Microsoft, too. But the important point, and I'd like to return to it, is that the focus, Jefferson Parish and Eastman Kodak, which do bind this court today, is not on the benefits from the combination. In Eastman Kodak, Kodak said, look, it is better to have parts and service sold together. That's what consumers want. And the court at 478 to 479 in the U.S. report said, maybe so. It's not an antitrust violation to combine it. But what we don't see the benefit of is forcing consumers to take that. Now, that same analysis should apply here. It may be a benefits to combining the operating system and the browser, but that's not the question. The question is, are there benefits to forcing <coughs> consumers to take those two products together? What do you, what do you make, then, of, um, of footnote 42 in Jefferson Parish, where the court suggests that had the hospital been able to justify the forced taking uh, on the basis of, for example, providing 24-hour service or flexible service, which is what they argued, you wouldn't apply a per se test. Well, I, I don't read the footnote that way, Your Honor. I read that footnote combined with several of the others as saying, don't tell us what the benefits are. There's one where the district court, they rejected the district court's focus on whether this improved health care. Those are decisions for the market to make. If the combination is better, the market will say that. If yeah, the, the, end of the, footnote, the end of the footnote says, um, since the district court made no findings as to why contractual would, a contract wouldn't have solved the problem, there is no basis for departing from our prior cases, suggesting that had they done it, they would have. <coughs> well, I, 
guess that's an inference I'm not prepared to make, given the other footnotes prior to that where the court said, we don't, basically, we don't care if this improves health care, because the question uh, along those lines is for the market to decide. Uh, and, and that's what, how the well, market, whole, that was you know, the one thing. There were a series of pre- and post-Jefferson Parish cases where courts took account of alleged business justifications for a tying and, and did not apply a per se rule if there was such one that couldn't be accomplished through some less restrictive means. Well, I don't think there's any dispute right. what the motivation for the tie was in this case. We've got it from the Microsoft documents. If you want to look at that, they're not going to be considered legitimate. This is uh, Mr. Alchin, quote, I don't understand how IE is going to win. We must leverage Windows more. In other words, and the so your answer, your answer to my question then is there is no legitimate business justification here. That's not your for point. the forcing. Right. There right. is, and, and this again, it's, it, I, I, I hesitate to repeat myself, but it is our basic point, and that is that we are not standing in the way of any combination. What we're standing in the way of is forcing. If the combination has benefits and is good, more power to them, but it's the forcing, saying even if consumers want that off, you can't take it off, that raises the problems but under the time. But the consumer can. The consumer can take it off, right? No. Uh, and, and again, the chronology is interesting. When you're talking about Windows 95 and Internet Explorer 3 and 4, yes, they could do the ad remove function, but the OEMs could not. Now The, right, the OEMs that, cannot, but if we're talking about consumer choice, and the consumer can, and doesn't your argument, if it doesn't fall apart, it at least becomes a little more suspect. They've made it very difficult for the ultimate consumer to remove Internet Explorer, even though it was easy with Windows 95, and even though it was only a matter of contract with Internet Explorer 1 and 2. It's a steady progression doing exactly what they what can remove it or not, they can certainly hide it. And if they choose to, if well, they're if sophisticated they know, enough yeah. to know they want a different anesthesiologist, they could call him and put him on the... Started. Well, again, uh, two points. One, it's not easy to run, uh, to, to hide it for the consumer who opens the box. You, I thought somebody said that you just take the icon and move it to the trash. No, no, no. no. It's not that, that, that's not the Felton. Felton's program removes the browser functionality. It's not easy to hide it without affecting well, the operation. No, hiding it as far as the overall consumer. How, how is the consumer harmed be, as between the Felton program? And if it's the case that you can take the icon and put it in the trash, how is, how is he harmed by not knowing the Felton program? Well, I, if you just take, my understanding is if you just take the icon and put it in the trash, there are many other ways to activate. Sure there are, if the consumer chose to do so. Yes. There are lots of ways to get back into it. The point but it's at, not there bothering the, com the consumer as he brings up his startup screen and puts Netscape on it. The you consumer know, is not... The argument really sounds not so much a concern about IE being there, because we all know that consumers can choose not to use it. I mean, I, we all understand that. That isn't the question, which you're really aggravated about in, in the case, is that Netscape is not there. And Netscape has difficulty getting there. What, what we're aggravated about is that the consequence... It's a shortcut to our legal the, terminology. The, <laughs> The, it's a long decision, day, the decision about what is there, about what OEMs are going to offer, is not being made by competition. It's being made by Microsoft's tie. That's what we're aggravated about. If Internet Explorer could compete with Navigator, it should have competed on the merits. Their documents spell out saying, we can't win on the merits, so we have to leverage the OS asset. Now, that has consequences. It has consequences in the market for the tied product. Navigator is out in the cold. It also has fundamental consequences for maintaining Microsoft's operating system monopoly. And that is why, that's why Lorraine Journal is such an important case. That was the situation where you had the, the, the and, the and why this tie? It. Pardon me? Why didn't the government cite it? Uh, it, it was in the amicus brief that was, was filed. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> The, the rule against tying. <laughs> the, 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 the reason it's important is because it recognizes what's going on here. You had the newspaper with a monopoly. New technology came along. And a nakedly exclusionary contract. A nakedly right? exclusionary, a reverse tie. Advertise with them. You cannot any way advertise with us. A reverse tie. And what the Supreme Court's opinion said this is a big problem because 
you are trying to snuff out innovation that threatens your monopoly. That is exactly what is going on with the tie in this case. The browser represented a threat to Microsoft's operating system monopoly, and Microsoft leveraged that monopoly to foreclose competition in the, in the tied product market, because that was a way of the snuffing whole, the out whole that market threat. Or just the OEM? What about IAP? Oh, well, if, if, a leading, if a leading IAP uh, with, with a market power and a large share said, look, you want, you want my uh, service, you've got to take Navigator, is that illegal tying? I would think it would. There would be separate, uh, well, I, mean, I guess I'm not sure if there would be separate products between what the IAP is providing and what the browser is providing. But if they were separate products... Well, the browser is a separate product according to your argument here, isn't it? Well, you'd also have to meet the other requirements for a tie, and that's why... The, the well, it forecloses. But is there, but is there, is there market power? Uh, I, I assume and, there was. And, and if, if it is forced, um, then yes, and if there is foreclosure, if all the elements are met, it would satisfy that test. Uh, but it did in the case of, of the OEMs for the same reason that caused the Supreme Court such concern in Lorraine Journal. And I would just like to start again and yeah, finish. I'd like to pursue Judge Randolph's hypotheticals. Uh, suppose, suppose you had a, a much more monopolistic IAP market and AOL has a huge share. But let's suppose that all the other, all the little IAPs uh, also, the minute you sign up, they send you whatever their browser is. When you, when, you, when you download it, it just automatically flows in so that everyone, everyone signing up with any IAP finds himself with some browser. And, 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 and not but, allowed but all they've paid, they've paid just the way they pay ordinarily, the 20 bucks a month, right? Now, I think on your theory, even though they're absolutely <coughs> free to <coughs> switch browsers, we've got a tie. No, no. If they're a per free. C tie. If they're free to switch, there's no f no forcing. Well, you're, you're free, to, free to switch by having a month sign up with another IAP, for example, and you get a, get a free browser without any difficulty. Well, they just you, pop at you from the net. But but that's not how it works with the OEM channel, and that's the difference. The difference there the is the consumers. People using their browser have gone beyond the OEM channel. They're heading towards the net, aren't they? Oh, certainly. They did not only foreclose the OEM channel, but took. Uh, actions with respect to IAPs with internet service vendors across the board. People are free to switch. If people are free to switch, then there's no forced tie. The uh, if I if I buy equipment that has only IE on it, I'm free to switch. Well, you're free to switch, but the the what the district court found is that the OEM channel is the key one for affecting competition, and consumers are going to basically take what comes with the system. And that is not the result of competition. That is the result of Microsoft leveraging its OS, OS asset, as it, as it explained. And it sounds like the Section 2 case. What, what do you make of the 60 million downloads? Well, there's a difference between usage and distribution. And again, the district court found the key question is usage. It doesn't mean 60 million people are using No, no, but does it mean that 60 million people took a look at it? The significance of that number is very unclear. We don't know what it mean, what it means. Twenty of those sixty million are me trying to download it. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, it makes thirty between us. <laughs> I, I don't know what it means, but again, the critical point: it does not mean usage, and usage is the key question when it comes to whether it would develop into an alternative platform for software applications. But, but it, 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 there may be some ambiguity about what the 60 million means, but it must mean at the very least, must it not, a significant number in the millions of individuals downloaded Netscape and used it. I'm, I'm right. unwilling to speculate that it even means that, Your Honor. Uh, you put an exhibit, the government put an exhibit in, it's government's 23 uh, at the uh, remedy stage, showing that in 1998, when this 60 million download figure was, that, uh, that Netscape had a 50% market share that dropped by uh, March 2000 to, to less than 20%. Is that the chart? Uh, right, yeah. right. Joint, yeah, joint Appendix 14. I mean, we may be getting ahead of ourselves, but if you had some 
had an evidentiary hearing on that chart, then maybe we would have some indication of what 60 million downloads mean. Well, we don't think that Microsoft has shown that the findings of fact, again, 239 to 241, which say, for example, that Navigator has only a tiny percentage of distribution through the OEM channels, we don't think they've carried their burden of showing that that is clearly erroneous. But the answer, the answer to the 60 million downloads is yes, that was 1998, and look what happened after that. Well, and it was a sharp drop because, of course, the browser was already there, the OEMs were not going to put another one on, and that's what consumers got. But, but you're losing sight of the difference between usage and, and, and availability. If the download really means that some number, some number, let's say, between 10 and 60 million people downloaded it, had access to it, and nonetheless decided to use IE, you don't have any complaint about that, do you? Oh, no, if they decide, if they're comparing Navigator and IE and they're choosing IE, okay, that's well, competition. Okay, well, there's a, this we highly no suggestive datum 60 million downloads well, that suggest that people are people who have already bought a PC. So by definition, they've been by your account, they've been force-fed Explorer, are now downloading Navigator. Right? It's not people who don't have a PC. It's not people who don't have IE. It's people who do have it. I don't think there's any basis for the speculation that it's not being used because IE is a better product. The district court found that there is no basis for assuming IE was a better product. It found there was a steady decline in usage, and right. it found that that usage was caused by the tie and the other efforts if, that Microsoft If the 60 made. million means 60 million people actually had it on their machine, and the usage is plummeting, do well, you really have a problem if with that? If it's the result of competition, no. But if it's the result of competition, why does Microsoft have to force people to take them together. If they're willing to compete, why don't they do what was the case in because the prior? Because they're entering a market where Netscape had 80 percent. Well, but that's always the case when there are barriers to entry. It's, a, it's what protects them in the operating system market. But that doesn't mean that they're free to engage in what constitutes illegal conduct under Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Okay, your time is up. Mr. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. I have just a few points uh, to make, Your Honor. Uh, on the question of whether uh, OEMs are willing to ship two browsers, I'd like respectfully to invite the Court's attention to the fact that three OEMs testified at trial, Compaq, Apple, and IBM, and they all ship two browsers. <laughs> There is also testimony in the record. Can those browsers be removed? Those browsers can be removed because the implementation of the browser in those cases is as an application and not as operating system uh, functionality. Just to be complete here, can you tell us which two? I'm sorry? Which two do they ship? Uh, I believe in the case of IBM, it was an IBM-developed browser called uh, Web Explorer, and uh, Netscape, I think. In the case of Apple, it was Internet Explorer and uh, uh, Netscape. Uh, and in the case of Compaq, I believe it was Internet Explorer and Netscape. There are other browsers available uh, in the marketplace that are shipped by other OEMs. Uh, doesn't the fact that they can be removed mean that it is not comparable to the forced tie that Microsoft offers? Uh, with great respect, Your Honor, I don't believe that's so. There's no indication uh, that, uh, that first of all, in those cases, uh, uh, there's no question, well, in the case of IBM and Apple, there's no question about removal by an OEM because IBM and Apple are integrated uh, uh, providers of uh, 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 computers and software. Oh, but the consumer can remove it. Yes. Right. Mr. Urowski, you said in your opening uh, argument that uh, this wasn't a forced purchase of a second product because Microsoft is not charging for essentially what, giving what it away. What constrains what 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 restrains Microsoft from charging for Internet Explorer? 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. What constrains Microsoft from charging for Internet Explorer? Well, Microsoft could have charged for it, but the practice of longstanding in the development of operating systems over time is that they include more and more features and functionality without separate charge. In other words, if you think about it, basically what it means is that over time the price of operating systems, quality adjusted price of operating systems, has been going down. If Netscape disappeared from the face of the earth tomorrow, Microsoft could impose a $10 charge on its next version of Windows for Internet Explorer and there'd be absolutely no constraint, right? Oh, I don't agree with that. There are... Is it the competition with other versions of Windows that constrains you? It's competition with other versions of Windows. It's competition uh, with the installed base, which will refuse to uh, uh, acquire new operating systems. There's, uh, there is pervasive piracy in the software industry. As soon as you begin to move the price of a software product, you will engender resistance. That's why one of the reasons Microsoft doesn't do it. It's one of the reasons why there hasn't been an increase of any significance in the price of Windows since August 1995, notwithstanding the hundreds and hundreds hundreds of millions of dollars that have gone into research and development to produce Windows 98 and uh, subsequent uh, 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 improved versions. Uh, further to this theme about uh, operating system providers, uh, about OEMs not willing to ship to browsers, Mr. Barksdale's complaint in his direct testimony was that Prior to 1996, meaning from August 1995 to August 1996, he was getting tremendous distribution in the OEM channel. At that time, every copy of Windows 95 coming out of the OEM channel had Internet Explorer on it. If he was getting tremendous distribution during that year, then obviously the OEMs were willing to ship two browsers on the product. They weren't afraid of uh, uh, increased uh, costs associated with providing service. The problem arose for Mr. Barksdale when Microsoft dramatically improved Internet Explorer with the release of version 3, and the OEMs then had a true quality browsing software on the machine, and therefore they weren't going to pay Netscape to ship the browser. Indeed, in some instances, they wanted to be paid to do it. You said that Apple ships two, two browsers, right? Yes. Didn't the district court find that Apple shipped the IE browser only after Microsoft threatened to discontinue Mac Office. Uh, the district court makes that as a uh, finding, but of course, even the district court acknowledges uh, that there was a far larger uh, set of disputes between Microsoft and Apple, uh, which had to do uh, uh, mostly with uh, patent and other intellectual property claims that Apple was uh, preparing to... I don't, I, don't, I don't understand the relevance of that. Because all of the issues that uh, affecting the relationship between Microsoft and Apple were resolved in a set of three agreements negotiated together and executed on the same day. So they're all subject to the same threat. What I'm saying is that I don't this see why, was a why more adding things to the threat mix it makes any difference. If they, if the resolution of this set of disputes was done under the uh, under the shadow of Microsoft's threat to discontinue Mac Office, I'm not sure what it tells us about the significance of Apple's carrying two browsers. 
Well, it was, but it was also the product of, of a cross-licensing arrangement between Apple and Microsoft. It was also the product of uh, uh, an investment in uh, Apple by Microsoft, which that, essentially... That's a little surprising that, that they carry Explorer in a folder. Navigator is the default browser. Right? Even after this agreement, no, Apple I continued to, to uh, Navigator as the default browser. That's not... Is that right? No, do I have it, not. Do I have it turned around? That, it, precisely right. So they carried Explorer under the agreement as the default Navigator in the folder. That's correct, okay. Your Honor. Any separate data on the record on usage among Apple users? Uh, not, uh, not in the record. I suppose Apple users are particularly prone to avoid Internet Explorer. That's uh, what I have, uh, I have seen data, but there. they're not in the record, yeah. and your intuition is correct. <laughs> uh, I want to make just a couple of other p points. Uh, one is that I think we have to come to grips with the fact that the government's position currently on what constitutes IE is simply access uh, to software that is on the computer and that what they define as a uh, uh, breaking of the alleged tie is removing consumer access to the product. And that is not what is normally viewed as a tying arrangement. And it is very difficult to see what is accomplished uh, for the benefit of consumers by permitting OEMs to hide that functionality from them. Well, under the more conventional view, if there is a tie, it's at the time of sale, right? That's correct. So if there's a tie, it's your bundling explorer in, not your making it difficult to remove. That would be correct. If that could be conceptualized as a tie, as opposed to integration of the functionality, then it's hard to see how that tie is vitiated by hiding the functionality from the end user. I think it's more insult to injury if you really believe that it's a tie. Uh, there is in the record, Defendant's Exhibit 68, a private placement memorandum for Netscape. Uh, it's dated January 1995, where they acknowledge, frankly, that they, in, in making disclosure to investors, that uh, several uh, uh, operating system suppliers are already bundling uh, uh, browsing software with the operating system and that they have every reason to believe that every uh, uh, operating system supplier will do it in time at, I think the phrase is, quote, little or no cost, close quote. I think this addresses uh, 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 the court's interest in the question of whether there is a market for browserless operating systems. I think even Netscape recognized the clear trend as far back as January of 1995. Well, let me ask you the same question. Was, uh, was Mr. Roberts correct that indeed if I searched really hard and looked at what he has referred me to that I will find data supporting the district court suggestion that there is a market for browserless operating systems? I think you will find some bits of evidence that suggest that some customers at one point along the way didn't want, uh, wanted a version of Windows 95 that didn't have browsing software in it. And those customers generally were satisfied by a version of Windows 95 that did not have uh, 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 IE1 or IE2 in it, which is to say uh, the original version released 
in the retail channel as opposed to the OEM channel. Whether there is any reason to believe after uh, 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 Internet Explorer was improved in August 1996 that there was a measurable group uh, of uh, uh, purchasers who were interested in uh, 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 the upgraded version of Windows 95 without any browsing software I think is, is debatable. In any event, there is no real quantification. Isn't the question, isn't the, isn't the more precise question here whether there is a market for operating systems uh, with browsers that can't be removed? Isn't that the question in view of the government's theory that this is a forced tie? Uh, uh, I, I don't believe that that uh, I, I don't believe that that is the relevant inquiry, Your Honor. I think that the, it is the government's burden to show if the Jefferson Parish test were applied, that there was demand for uh, browserless operating systems and a separate demand for browsers, and under Jefferson Parish, as I read it, that it was not efficient to deliver them together to the market, which of course it almost certainly was, uh, because uh, adding additional software to a software product uh, essentially costs nothing. And software products are frequently distributed together where there's uh, uh, the thought that they may be complementary. Uh, I think uh, my last point uh, is uh, that uh, we do not accept finding a fact 185. It is one of, I guess, maybe two dozen or so findings that we are challenging. Uh, that is the finding uh, relating to uh, 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 the effect of running uh, uh, Mr. Felton's uh, prototype a program to remove access, end user access to Internet Explorer. There is testimony at December 14, 1998, morning session at page 42, that running uh, Mr. Felton's program leaves 99.9% .9 of the Windows code intact. I, I said that was my last remark, but I, I looked down. I made the mistake of looking down uh, uh, for a moment, and I thought I would just add one observation in response to a question that was addressed to Mr. Roberts about whether it would be an unlawful tie for Microsoft to bundle both Internet Explorer and Navigator with Windows. Uh, and I might point out that that was in part the relief that the government initially sought in this case. It's in the prayer in the complaint. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, this part of the case is submitted. We will reconvene again tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Shortly after the court recessed for the day, attorneys and corporate officials monitoring the case spoke to reporters outside the courthouse. Speakers include former independent counsel Kenneth Starr and Ed Black, president of the